I remember growing up as a child, and uh, believe it or not, I did grow up, and, and I remember growing up with a child asking my dad one Father's Day, I was 10, 11 years old, I asked, Dad, what do you want for Father's Day? What, 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 what present do you want? And I was so proud of myself because I had not waited to that Sunday morning to ask him. I mean, this was a couple of days before, you know. I'm showing some maturity and some growth in my, my, uh, my, um, my life. And, and um, I was both shocked and amazed at his, his answer. Um, I, I, I was shocked because it, his answer was so simple. And I was amazed that it did not include anything that I could buy him. This is what he said. John, all I want is peace and quiet. Now, how many have ever asked for peace and quiet? I mean, this became the staple request of my dad. Dad, what do you want for your birthday? Peace and quiet. What do you want for father? Peace and quiet. What do you want? Peace and quiet. This is what he wanted over and over and over again. And, and you know what's funny? You know what I want? peace and quiet. You know, that's what I want. Especially this last week, I had congestion in my head behind my ears that were pointing, pushing out against my eardrum. I felt like my head was going to explode. I needed to put tape around it to hold it in. I went to the doctor and um, the, uh, he gave me a prescription to help uh, cure that and make it feel better. But during that time until the medicine, I kept on saying, not so loud, Anna. Katie, don't, don't, don't scream so loud. Just, I just want some peace because it hurt my ear every time that I, that noise was too loud. There's a lot of noise in our lives today. There's a lot of things that just grab and demand our attention. I'm not talking about just volume. The noise is loud, yes? I mean, it's loud, but it's also dense. It's coming from so many different sources that we just, we just want some peace and quiet. And when you have the blessed privilege of somebody giving you their attention, it's a privilege indeed. They have turned off their phone. They have switched off the TV. The book that they have, they have dog-deared the page, closed the book, they have sat, set it aside, and they look right at you with so many different noises and things that demand our attention. When we find somebody who is willing to give us their undivided attention, it is a privilege indeed. Not that you have to force their attention. I mean, there's a lot of people that we demand their attention. But when it's given to you, it's special. Let me tell you what this journey through the Lord's Prayer and where it connects to us with us today brings us. That the whole heart of Christianity is centered around the fact that God intentionally and deliberately reaches out to you and me and says, you have my attention. It's not that you have to even twist his arm. It's not even that you have to earn it. Oh, how many times have we lived in a relationship where we felt that we had to earn somebody else's attention? Do you ever get to a place where you felt you've done enough? God says, and that the fun, this, this becomes the fundamental truth that everything else is built on. You have my attention. This is what he says to us. And if this is the center of Christianity, our prayer as modeled through, by Christ through the Lord's Prayer, our prayer becomes a response to this where we say, God, I know you are giving me your attention. Now I am giving you my attention for if it is just for a brief moment. And if you look at the, the formula and 
not the formula, but the structure of the Lord's Prayer, what you will be amazed is, is that the, all of them are a request for God to do something. They're centered around this, this idea of, God, this is what I want you to do. May your name be great in my life. May your kingdom come. May your will be done. And then it gets down to the nitty gritty where he, we say, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive me of my trespasses. Restore that relationship between me and you as I do that through myself and other people. And lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And you can see that these are requests. You see, what Jesus is saying is, God has, you have God's attention. Jesus would never have said you could go to God and pray and ask for these things if you didn't already have his attention. What do you need, God asks. What's going on in your life, God asks. Max Licata says this, when you enter his presence, the attendants turn to you and they to hear your voice. And there's no need to fear that you will be ignored. Even if you stammer or stumble, even if what you have to say impresses no one, it will impress God and he listens. And so when we get to this point, and we get to this fundamental understanding of, of what this journey has brought us, we come to lead me not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now I got to tell you that this is probably one of the most difficult parts of the Lord's Prayer. It has... Um, I mean, theologians have struggled with this because the question is, I thought God does not tempt us. How can God lead us? And they get that from James 1.13. And it says, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm be tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. And so they, they say, how can God lead me into temptation? Why do I need to pray to be that God would not lead me into temptation if God does not tempt us at all? I, I wish I had a brilliant response for that. I, I wish I could eloquently tell you what that means. But I think the best way to explain it is an illustration. This first part where it says, lead me not into temptation, is best understood with this illustration. It's not mine, but it's wonderful. A father and a son were walking down the street one winter morning. And the father told the son, look out and be careful not to step on the ice. Because you'll slip and you'll fall. But the boy didn't listen. The boy was quick and careless and got to a point where his foot came down on a patch of ice and as his foot went down, his other foot went up and the foot slipped under, out from under him and he fell down. And he got up and he said to his dad, I'm sorry. And he apologized profusely. I'm sorry for not listening. And then he did this. He put his little hand in his dad's large hand and said, please, don't let me slip again. Please, help me avoid this slippery spot again. This is the beautiful picture of what God does in the Lord's Prayer. When we say, lead us not in temptation, it's not that God is leading us down. We're saying, God, don't do that. Don't do that. It is a prayer that we are strong enough within ourselves to say, I, want, I do not want to fall into this temptation. 
And God, the only way I know to avoid this temptation is to keep my hand in your hand. And so as I hold on, I say, please keep me from the slippery spots. Because if we're honest with ourselves, the tension in our lives is that every day we face temptations that will have the potential of wrecking our faith and our confidence in God. Every day you face temptations that have the potential of wrecking your faith and your confidence in God. Maybe it's a conversation that you're about to have with somebody where you tear down the character of somebody else. And you're tempted to do that because you want the record. You think that he or she is too high and mighty, needs to be knocked down a peg, and leave it to you and I to do that. So we're tempted to do that. Maybe we're tempted to lie, to steal, to cheat on something where we are able to get the results and the reward quickly. Maybe it's that alluring link on the internet that tempts us. Every day, we face temptations that have the potential of wrecking our faith. And in the world around us, these are celebrated as normal, as individuality of being your own self. But in God's economy, in God's kingdom, these are outside of his will and desires for you. And when we say lead us not into temptation, what we're saying is, God, I know that I am prone to mess up over and over again. Hold on to my hand and keep me from slippery spots. Keep me from slippery. Keep me from being pulled away from you. Now, this lead us not into temptation. This is a prayer that's prayed, well, you, let's say it's prayed every morning. It's a prayer that we pray in advance of some specific. It's a general prayer. Lead us not into temptation. But it's closely connected to the deliver us from evil. Because where the lead us not into temptation might be a prayer that we pray in the morning and a general prayer that we say, God, I'm not sure what today holds, but lead me not. Let me, keep me from the slippery spots. The deliver us from evil, that's a prayer for the immediate moment you find yourself to te tempted. That, that's the prayer that you pray at that split moment. You know that if you open your mouth and say something, you know it's not going to be right. If you go to this email, you know you are going to go to a link you don't want to go to. If you get to a place where you are in the company of friends who may have succeeded more, you, you may be tempted to lie, cheat, or steal to get further than them. And at that split moment, this is the prayer, this part of the prayer, deliver us, rescue us, is a prayer that we cry out for that split second moment where we're about to do or are tempted to do the wrong thing. And, and so what the scriptures say is that, that when we are at that moment of temptation, I like to... Uh, um, refer to James that he says, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. This is one of those promises. There is no subjunctive. There's no possibility of this might happen or this will not happen. This is a promise. If you resist, he will flee. If you resist, evil will flee. Temptation will flee. Maybe just for a few moments, maybe for 15 seconds, but you can do it over again. You can resist, you can resist. That's why I think at that split second that you know that you're about to be tempted, you take five seconds to take a breath 
and pray, deliver me. Deliver me from evil. Rescue me. But it's not outside that context of the communion of God being holy, of you saying, may your name be great, may your kingdom come, may your will be done. It's in that context that we're able to say these words, rescue me. Now, I I know that we find ourselves in places where we have already messed up, fallen to temptation. We think evil has won. We find ourselves in places that um, the noise of the, 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 uh, the world, and, and specifically, you could say that temptation has a noise too. It's loud. It pulls us. It shouts our, our, our name. It, it demands our attention. And at those moments when we succumb to it and we give in to it, there is the promise that God is able to use what Satan uses as evil or desires as evil as good in us. To grow us, to give us strength, to give us opportunities to be more uh, confident in God. Let me just give you an example before you write me off from saying that. Think of Moses. When he was in Egypt, and God called him to, um, uh, well, before God called him at the burning bush, he killed an Egyptian. And he fled to Midian for 40 years. And I bet you, Satan believed that he had won. But even in that moment, God used that for his kingdom. You you can think of David or you can think of Peter. When Peter was standing right before the week before Jesus went into uh, Jerusalem to be crucified, Jesus uh, is um, talking about his church and and he says, upon this rock, Peter, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not be able to withstand it. And Jesus then talks about him going into Jerusalem to die. and, And Peter says, hey, I don't, want, he's, I don't want you to die. I'm not going to let you die. Evil thought that it had won because they got a man named Peter to speak out. And what Jesus say? get behind me, Satan. Or when Peter uh, denied Jesus, do you think evil thought it had won? It strengthened him. Gave him the ability to be more focused. What about when Jesus died on the cross? Do you think that Friday, evil thought it had won? We finally did it. We killed the son. But Sunday was right around the corner. Look. This prayer, especially this part, lead us not into temptation. It's a preparation. It's a prayer that we pray, God, keep me from the slippery spots. Help me not to always be listening to the sounds of the temptations. The prayer, deliver us from evil, is that prayer that is at that moment of, of, of temptation where we take that five seconds and say, no, th- this is not right. We either change our, our, our scenery, we change our location, we change uh, what we're uh, doing. But even after those preparations are ignored and we fall into that temptation, God still says, I got you. You still have my attention. You still are worth the life of my son. I still love you. 
and what evil and Satan and other people might think as, as a victory for them, they just scored a point for me. When Paul said, I have a thorn, and I prayed over and over that God would get rid of this thorn, and he said, no, this thorn was used by God to keep Paul humble. That's what he says. My grace is sufficient. My power is made perfect so that you can keep yourself from being conceited. See, this is the beautiful thing that we have. An invitation into a place where God says, you have my attention. So turn off the TV. Mute your phone. Put down the book. And give God your attention through prayer. And so may it be for us. Gracious Heavenly Father, Remind us that you have spoken into our lives and invited us to a place where we can be in conversation with you. And we pray that, God, you would continue to hold us, guide us, and deliver us, and rescue us as we remind ourselves that you are to be holy in our lives and your kingdom is to come and your will is to be done. I guess, God, the final part of the Lord's Prayer will be our doxology also. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.